Thanks, everyone. So, as you can see, today I'm going to talk about recursion, and that you already know, right? But one thing that you probably don't know is that this talk is going to have 100% live coding. So I have zero slides in total. Uh, I only have two images. And well, that's because when I was preparing this talk, you know, I think I got to 80 or 100 slides, and I was like, well, I don't think this is, first of all, I don't think this is fun enough. And second of all, I don't think this is the right way to explain recursion, you know, because I want to build something with you. I want to go through the steps of things with you, and I want you to see how I think and, you know, go through the whole process so you can really understand what's happening. So rather than just showing you things, I'm going to, like, rather than just telling you things, I'm going to show you things, I'm going to show you how they happen. So if you want to send me messages on Twitter, you can find me at the Wizard Lucas, or some of my tests have been translated to Russian, by the way, on lucasfcosta.com. And without further ado, let's answer the most obvious question we have to answer in this talk, right? So what is recursion? Well, that might seem like a simple answer, but actually varies slightly from context to context. And if you see, for example, the early ACM algorithms, they describe some of them as recursive, even though they're iterative. And that's because they use recursion in the meaning from its Latin word, which is hecohere, which means run again. And essentially, they're just applying the same solution, right, to smaller instances of the same problem, which is why they say those algorithms are actually recursive. And that's also why quicksort is said to be a recursive algorithm, even when sometimes it is implemented iteratively. And it's the same reason why we say that trees and lists, for example, are uh, naturally recursive data structures, even though we might not use always recursion to deal with them. But in the formal sense, and I think that the, the broadest way to define recursion, and the meaning I want to give it in this talk, is a circle definition, right? It's when you define something in terms of itself. In more technical terms, is when you use the designata, the thing you're, you're defining, in its definition, in its own definition, right? So you have a circle definition. And I'm going to start this talk with the most common example, which you all probably have already seen, which is the factorial function, right? So it's very simple. So you're going to start with the factorial function. And if n is 0, by definition, the factorial of 0, right, is 1. So here, otherwise, I'm going to do n times the factorial of n minus 1. And that's the factorial function, right? Very simple. So if you want to get the factorial of 5, that's the same as 5 times the factorial of 4, and so on until you get to 0, which is uh, the atomic definition of it. It's the atomic case, right? The base case, which just returns 1. So let's just run this, right? So let's do this. And in here on your right, you will be able to see the results of the things I run. So that's 120, right? That's very easy. But what I want you to be aware in this case is how to visualize it, right? So if I actually show you this, this is how uh, this, this factorial function gets executed, right? So what I want you to see here is that each call to the factorial function only invokes it once more. So we have linear recursion, right? So each call generates one other call. And so one also, also one, one important thing to notice here is that we need to go all the way to the bottom until we reach a base case. So the factorial of one can also be defined atomically as one, right? So you can find this as this. So here we need to evaluate this all the way down to the bottom before we can actually go up to the top and get a result. So when you call factorial of five, you're gonna then call five times the factorial of four, which is then gonna call five times the factorial that five times four times the factor of three, and so on, until you get to the factor of one. And only when you get this last result, you can start resolving the calls, right, from down here to up here. And another uh, very common example for recursion is the Fibonacci function, right? So that's also very simple. However, the Fibonacci function is not linearly recursive. So here I'm gonna implement this like this, I'm gonna do Fibonacci n minus one, and then I'm gonna get this, 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 and do this. Um, hope that's not too fast. Um, so we now have the Fibonacci sequence. We can do just this. And we get it here on your right Fibonacci numbers. And that's easy, but the thing I want you to notice here is that 
this is different from Protor in the sense that each call to Fibonacci generates two other calls. So we actually visualize this as a tree. And what I want you to see here is that when we actually evaluate this, we need to do a death first traversal. So when we call Fibonacci of four, we're not going to evaluate Fibonacci of three and Fibonacci of two instantly, right? We're going to go to Fibonacci of three because we need to evaluate first here, its left side, right? And then inside Fibonacci of three, we also have to evaluate its left side again for Fibonacci of two. And then Fibonacci of two, again, since it's not smaller than two, we evaluate its left side again. And only when we have this answer is that we can start evaluating the right side of Fibonacci of two, right? So we evaluate this, and then we get a result here, two. And then we're back to this call, and now we evaluate the right side of this call, right? So this is how I want you to uh, think about what happens when you call Fibonacci of four. And the same thing here, right? So only when we have resolved the whole left side of this tree is that we can go to its right side, right? And then once we have the results of these two nodes here, then my Fibonacci of four call is gonna return, right? So I stack all the way to here. I do that first traversal before I can get the result up here, right? And you know, having this, this mental model on your head like being able to think about recursion this way is, is very useful for you to, because then you can really understand concepts like the stack trace, which is also something that I'm gonna show you how to do with it. But actually when designing recursive algorithms, that's something I would advise against. Because you know, the first thing I would do when actually designing a recursive algorithm is to think about the base case, right? And here I'm gonna write some functions that are not as simple as the factorial and the Fibonacci function. So, the first thing you do is think about the base case. The second thing you do is make sure you break down the problem correctly. And that's important because since recursion is all about applying the same solution to smaller instances of the same problem, it means that if you know when to stop recurring and if you have broken down your problem correctly, then you don't need to think about the entire hierarchy of calls. And that's the whole point of having recursion, right? Because it's more declarative. You don't have to worry about you know, flow control. You define the problem in terms of what it is. It's more declarative. So you actually don't think about what happens inside of each call. And one, one example of this is, for example, when you want to get the maximum number in an array, right? So let's here have an array, which I'm gonna call like list, let's say. I'm gonna add a bunch of numbers inside of it, just uh, not necessarily ordered. Is that enough? Let's add some more. Okay, fine. So if we want to get the maximum number in this list, right, what can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is apply the same solution to smaller instances of the same list, right? So I can cut the list in smaller pieces and also always keep track of what's the maximum value into them. So for me to get the maximum number in my list, I can just have a maximum value which I can start, for example, at max minus infinity. And what's the base case here? Well, the base case here is when the list is empty, right? So when the array length is empty, means I have control of it, so I can just return the maximum I already have. Otherwise, what can I do? Well, I can get the head of my list, I can get the rest of my list, and then for the rest of my list, I'm gonna compare that to the maximum number I already have, so I can just return the maximum number of my, the rest of my list, and then if x is bigger than the maximum number I already have, I will just return x as the maximum for the next call. Otherwise, I can just do here the maximum I already have. All right, so if I do the max number of my list, and I console log that. Oh, I'm running the wrong file. Ooh, I get nine, nice. Um, so I know live coding is funnier, uh, it's more fun when someone fails. Um, I don't know if I can guarantee I'm gonna fail, but uh, I hope you enjoy it anyway. And another algorithm that I quite like to implement recursively is quicksort, as we've said. So I like to implement quicksort in this very Haskell-y way. And we can apply the, same, the very same process here for quicksort, right? Because if you think about what a sort array is, it's just 
basically you get a number and you put the smaller numbers to its left, right, like this, and you put the bigger numbers to its right. And then if you wanna make sure it's ordered, you just need to make sure you have ordered both sides, right? So if you also sort this side and this side, and X is already in the correct position, then you're gonna get here the smaller items for Y in this side, the bigger items for Y in this side, you get X, and then again you concatenate with the sorted side that's bigger than X, right? Like this, and if you apply this all the way down to get an empty list, which is by default sorted, well then it means you have a sorted array. So we can just do array, and now one thing that we can do is think about what the base case is, which is when the array length is zero, because that's already sorted, so you can just return that, and we don't have to worry. Now, how can we break down this problem? Well, as we've seen, we need the smaller elements, right, and the bigger elements. So for the smaller elements, all we can do is filter the rest of my list, actually. So we're gonna do this, right? So I'm getting the head of my list, the rest of my list, like this, and I can filter these. So I'm gonna get all the elements that are smaller or equal to X, and then I'm gonna quick sort that side, and for bigger, I can do the very same thing. Which means that now, when I return, I can just return, here I'm gonna use concat, just to make this clear, so I can just concatenate the smaller items with the item in the middle, and with the bigger items, right? So now if we, for example, sort my list, whoops, I've made a mistake somewhere. True, here I missed this because I just copied and pasted the line above. Okay, now it works, see? I failed once in live coding, that's good. Had some fun. Um, okay, and now, uh, one another concept that I think is very important for you to understand when we talk about it. Was this too quick, by the way? Is this fine? Please raise your hands if this was fine. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So, for the stack, I'm gonna. So, this is actually a concept that's not necessarily related to recursion, but you run into more problems when you do uh, have to do with the stack when you're using recursion. And this is also what's gonna lead us to the next few topics in this talk. Um, so basically, the stack is what helps your program keep, tra keep track of what's running at the moment. So here I'm gonna start with some functions. I'm just gonna make some functions A, B, C, and D, and I'm gonna replace this, this, and this, and I'm gonna call A, right? So I'm gonna use here console.trace, so you can get the stack trace for each of these calls, right? So I'm gonna, first of all, just call A and log the stack trace before and after A, right? So let's run the right file. So what do we get? Well, here, as you can see, we start with the global context, then we stack A on top of it, right? And then once A is done running, we remove A from the stack. So basically, whenever a function calls other function, it goes on top of it on the stack, right? Which means that, if I start calling here from A, B, and then I start calling here from B, like say, let's say C, and in C I also have a console trace, let's see what happens. So A calls B, which calls C, and C also does a console trace. So we start from the global context, we stack A on top of it, A then calls B, so B goes on top of A, and then since B calls C, we stack C on top of it. Now, if we logged us removing these calls from the stack, you would see that we would have B and A, and then only A, and then we get back to the global context. So if you look back to the calls we've just talked about, like factorial, we stack all these calls, right? These is, uh, you can imagine like this same thing, but upside down, right? We st we're stacking calls all the way until we get to the bottom before we can actually start evaluating things from here all the way up. And for Fibonacci, it's kind of the same thing, right? Because you do a depth first reverse, so we stack all of this here in this direction, right? Before you can actually uh, get the final result. So you stack all of these calls, then you unstack this one, then you stack, put this one on top of the stack, and you resolve this, and you go back all the way 
to Fibonacci, right? And now let's see what happens when we have, for example, the Fibonacci function that we had in our first example. So I'm just gonna write it here. Actually, I'm gonna just copy it from there. So let's say I have this, right? Our factorial function, and I add a console trace here. Let's see how this looks like. So let's call it the factorial five. What do we get? Okay. So we start here with this call, which is the factorial five. Then the factorial of five is gonna ask for the factorial of four, which is gonna ask for the factorial of three, and then factorial of two, and then factorial of one. And it's interesting to see that for each of these frames in the stack, we need to keep them all stacked because we need to wait for them to return before we can actually start calculating things. Because if you remember this here, we need to get this result before we can actually start resolving. So when we have five times the factorial of four, we cannot, we, we still cannot calculate this straight away, right? We need to first resolve this, and this, and this. Correct? So now, one thing that's fun is if we try to calculate a factorial of a very big number, right? So this is just gonna blow the stack away. So let's remove this console trace and see what happens. So we get maximum call stack size is seeded. And that's because we cannot infinitely stack frames on top of each other, right? Computers are physical things. They have limits. So you can actually see that if you have like a function which is like, I'm gonna call it explode, and it just calls itself infinitely until it gets an error and then we can return what's the number of calls we stacked. So you can just return one plus explode, and if you catch an error, we return one. So let's see what happens now. I don't even need this return, anyway. Ooh, explode. Why didn't this happen? One plus explode. Sorry, I think I missed something here. Well, um, sorry, I'm very nervous actually. So um, let me just think a bit. Um, okay, so please don't mind if I'm, I'm gonna skip this. Um, anyway, um, sorry. Sorry, anyway, um, let's just go on to, to tail calls. Uh, I can talk about that in the, the, the question section. Um, very sorry for that, but, well, so, um, tail calls, uh, what are tail calls? Tail calls are calls that are in tail position, which are the very last thing that a function does uh, before it actually returns the result, right? So, for example, let's get our factorial function from here, right? So if we get this from here, right, factorial function, this call is not in tail position because we need to keep track of n whenever we go down so that we can calculate stuff, right? So we cannot simply unstack frames, right? Which means that if we do, for example, the factorial of five here, we're gonna stack all these calls. Let me run this file. What do we get? Console trace. So we need to stack the calls because we need to keep track of what we're multiplying with so that we can get a result, right? However, we can make this call be in tail position by removing this argument so we don't need to, have to keep track of this n as we recurse, right? So we can just have an accumulator here and an accumulator which is an argument. And now, instead of returning one, I can just return the accumulated value and multiply that by n, right? So if I do this, then it means for each call of this function, I'm gonna have the accumulated value here. And then it means I don't have to keep all these frames in the stack, right? Because let's see what happens when I do this. Let's console log it. Okay, so we get 120. But the interesting thing here is that if we console dot trace this, we see that we are stacking calls, right? we don't necessarily need to stack them because now you see that we have all that we need to run for each call of this function. So you just, ha just have n and ACC here and let's remove the console trace to make it easy for you to, to see this. So we have 501 on the first call and then once we move on to the next call, we are gonna calculate a factorial of four and we are already going to multiply five by one. 
So we are accumulating the values as we go. So as you can see here, when we get to the end, when we calculate the factorial of one, we already have 120 accumulated, right? So you can just return that. And that means that when you stack frames, you don't actually need the previous frame. Because when you calculate this, for example, right, five times the factorial of four, you need the frame because you need to keep track of this five, right? If you already have it in your context, right, if you already have it here, when you go on to the next call, right, you don't necessarily need that. You can just not stack that at all. And that's something you can do with uh, proper tail calls. So when you have proper tail calls, it means that you don't need to stack calls on top of each other. So if you do, for example, this, and you use the harmony flag, so I'm using a very old version of Node, and I'm gonna explain why in a bit. So if you run, this is number four. So if you run this and you add console trace, I can show you how it looks like. And here now, as you can see, we're not stacking multiple calls to the factorial function. We only have one. Right, because we, on each call, we have all the context we need. So when we get to the end, we don't have to stack uh, all the frames in order to keep track of what we're going to multiply with. And that allows us to calculate the factorial for very big numbers. This is probably going to return something like infinity, but anyway. I added console trace. Let me move this. Okay. Yep, so now we don't blow up the stack anymore, right? And this, it's important to notice that proper tail calls, they're actually different from tail call optimization, right? So proper tail calls do not necessarily run your code, run, make your code run faster. It just allows you to be able to elide, to remove stack frames if you don't need them and if your call is in tail position. The rules here are a bit different if you have a generator function. But if it's the, last, the very last thing your function does, then you can have proper tail calls. And it, it's not only for when you're doing recursion that is important, right? So if you have like functional code which calls one zillion functions, then you can also run into a stack overflow. So this is also helpful in that case. And being able to not stack necessary frames is different from optimizing your code to run fast, right, when that happens. And the next thing here is, and the bad news, and the reason why I'm using a node, node version is because Actually, this support was removed. This was part of ECMAScript 6 spec, right? So this was in the spec for ES6. And I, I think the only browser that actually got to really uh, implement it and send it to production, I think it was Safari. Node had support for it, VA team had support for it, but since um, the other vendors didn't really implement this, then it was also removed and is not present uh, in older versions of uh, Node. But one way that you can run around this limitation right, on your versions of nodes uh, is by using, for example, trampolines. And we're gonna see why they have that name in a bit. So let's run this. So trampolines, as we're gonna see, is just a way of like kind of making your recursion lazy. And for that, I'm gonna use our good and node factorial example. So I'm gonna take this out of here and I'm gonna put this here. So for our factorial function here, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna first, of course, make it have all the context it needs to run. So I'm gonna have my accumulator here, which starts at one. I'm gonna have n times my accumulated value, and I'm gonna return my accumulated value, which is the very same thing I've just done here, okay? So now that we have that, let's just console log factorial, just for the sake of our sanity and we get 120, right. So now, if we do console trace, we'll see that we're stacking calls in this case, right? So we have multiple calls stacked on top of each other because we need to get all the way down to one before we can actually have a result. So one way of solving this is kind of lazifying it, which means instead of running this straight away, I can just return a function which does it, and what I can do here is just have a result which is also going to call the factorial of five, factorial of five, and then I can do a loop, which is what actually happens when you eliminate tail calls, right? So I have a loop, and while result is a function, I'm gonna keep asking for the next result. So I'm just gonna reassign to result, here, result. And I can then console log my result, 
and what do I get? 120. So I'm just lazifying it, right? So if we actually now go in back into a factory and we add a console trace, we will see that our stack will just have one call to the factorial. So this also allows me not to blow up the stack completely, right? So, um, one second. So I could wrap this in its own function. But the point here is that I'm making this function lazy. I'm adding a thunk so that I can keep asking for the result. And actually, if you're in lazy languages, that's kind of what happens. So let's go now. Uh, also, by the way, this is called a trampoline because what happens to the stack looks like a trampoline, right? So you get a stack here on the bottom, and then you stack a call to factorial, and factorial returns, you get to the bottom of the stack again, and then you also, again, ask for the next value, and then you go down, and then you go up. Right? So now let's move on, and let's move on to syntactic tail calls. And the interesting thing here is that you're going to notice in a bit how this is related to, like, the history of recursion in JavaScript has some parallels with the history of recursion in general. So syntactic tail calls is um, actually a proposal. We have a, a repository for it uh, on the TC on TC39 and. It's very disappointing if you go into their issues because I think one of the first ones is an issue called, is this proposal that? Um, so basically what happens is, since tail calls uh, were argued to be difficult to debug, they proposed to add uh, a explicit delimiter for it so that you know when you can light uh, frames or not in order to help you debug things so that you can treat these recursive calls differently, right? And let me show you why they think it's difficult to debug. So if we have, for example, a function A, right? which here calls, let's go into here and have function B and then a function C. So let's rename these. So if we have this, right, and A calls B and B calls C, right, that's the last thing they do. And then C throws an error. All right, so if we now call A, and we need to run the right file, which is six. So we get the full stack trace because we're not using here um, proper tail calls. We're not, we don't have proper tail calls, but if we do run it with proper tail calls, let's see what happens. When we get our error, we just have C on the top of the stack, right? We don't have A or B anymore, so we don't know who, get, who got there, who called it. Right, so it's very difficult to debug because you don't know if any other function called C or if it was just like this, this path that you expected, right? Because if you had, for example, another function G which would also call C, right, and you're trying to debug this code, well, which was the path that led to the error, right? And this is why they wanted to actually have a explicit delimiter for it so that you can enable this when it's convenient for you to debug or disable it, right? And another way of doing this is uh, with shadow stacks which is uh, when you have a separate stack so that you can keep track um, of your frames in order to debug them. But, well, this uh, has not gone forward and we actually don't have that. And this says a lot because it also, uh, as we were just talking, history kind of repeats itself. And now I'm gonna get into the more fun and playful part of this talk, which is talking a bit about the history of recursion. And then we're gonna try to we write it for a bit, right? So I want you to go back a bit. Let's go back to the 1950s, 1960s. Because at that time, computer scientists and engineers, they had this problem of how to communicate algorithms between each other efficiently, right? So they wanted to have one language, you know, one language to rule them all so that they could communicate efficiently their algorithms, right? And they had three criteria for this language. The first one is that it should be easily usable in publications. So it should be easy to read and easy to write. It should be easily understandable. And the criteria at that time for it to be easily understandable was for it to be close to mathematical notation because that's what they were used to at the time. And the third, and perhaps the most important criteria, was that it should be machine independent. Because at that time, many people didn't have machines, right? And even if they had, computers weren't as standardized as they are today. So you can't really easily run code uh, on multiple machines in the same code, right? So this led to what they called the international algebraic effort, which gave birth 
birth uh, to Ogo, the Ogo language, the international algebraic language. And just like in, TC, like, like in JavaScript, we have the TC39. In Ogo, we have the very original name, uh, named Ogo Committee. And they were the responsible people for, and they were the people responsible for writing the spec for the language, just like the TC39. And, you know, of course they had many disagreements because, you know, it's very hard to get smart people to agree on things. And one of these disagreements was the representation of floating points. And when I talk about the representation of floating points, I'm actually talking about whether you should use commas or dots because it was very difficult to get Europeans and Americans to, to agree on that matter. But a matter that wasn't so easy to get them to agree with was recursion. Because John McCarthy, the creator of Lisp, he actually wrote a letter to the Algo 60 committee and he asked them to, he was advocating for, the, for them to allow recursion in uh, Algo 60, right? So this proposal was all also refused and not only it was refused, but they also proposed to add a specific limiter for it, just like we had uh, here, we've seen for syntactic data calls. However, this limiter was also, they also refused uh, this limiter. Some people argued it was because they thought that recursive calls are just normal function calls and they should be treated differently. And other people argued that it was because they were against recursion in general. And this was in fact a debate of generalization versus specialization because Edgar Dijkstra, for example, which was one of the uh, strongest advocates for uh, recursion, he didn't have his own machine at the time in Amsterdam. While other people, the people that didn't want recursion to be in the language, they actually had very machine-dependent concerns, even though Olga was supposed to be a machine-independent uh, language. They worried about how hard it was going to be to implement, how hard it was going to be to reason about. They had machine-specific concerns. And it was actually because of this that we have the runtime stack concept as we've seen today. So once um, the, the last committee for Olgo happened, uh, Adel van Vijgarden, uh, I'm trying to pronounce this right because it's Dutch, so it's very difficult. Um, he uh, called uh, Peter Neur, uh, a name also speaking for uh, Edgar Dijkstra, and he said that he was very concerned with a lack of specification um, in, in, in the spec of the language. So he said that it wasn't clear what happens when you encounter like a, an activation of a procedure inside the procedure's body. And he just said, oh, can you add this very simple sentence which says that if you find an activation inside the body, it should just happen. And well, since recursion was not explicitly prohibited in the first draft, and they just wanted to make sure it was in, well, that sentence was included. And it, Peter was aware that it, this could cause trouble. But he included it anyway because he was charmed by its boldness and by its simplicity. But what I want to do here is imagine a world where this proposal wouldn't have been accepted, right? So can we still have recursion? And now I think it's going to be uh, the funniest part. So here I'm going to write, um, I'm going to get my Fibonacci function, the good node. So had we had recursion refused, right? Have we had explicitly recursive calls refused like this? Would we still be able to have recursion? Well, now one important distinction to make is between recursive procedure activations and recursive procedure declarations, right? Because you can still have recursive procedure activations without actually declaring them recursively like this, right? And here, the simplest way of doing this is just having mutual recursion. So instead of having Fibonacci function call itself, you can just have a replica of it and call it. And this is going to be the easiest way for us to get somewhere. Let's start with this very simple example. Let's go to this and let's run eight. And let's write this properly. So Fibonacci two which is this, and now we can call here, let's do a few measure four, right? So if we have this, what happens is that Fibonacci calls Fibonacci of two, which calls Fibonacci again. So we're basically having one function call the other, the function does not call itself, right? And we can even simplify this and we can remove all this and just make Fibonacci two call Fibonacci, but then, 
right? So that's one simple way we can do it. However, that's also very simple to prohibit, right? And one way that we can solve this is by actually self-applying Fibonacci. So we're just gonna apply Fibonacci to itself, right? So if we have Fibonacci, and here it calls the function that's passed to it, and we pass Fibonacci again, right, like this, then here, when we run this, we're gonna always be passing Fibonacci, so we're always gonna have the same function on Fn, right? So we can still, Fn is not a function, oh, I didn't pass Fibonacci initially, so we just pass Fibonacci. Fibonacci 2 is not defined, so it's this, this needs to be Fn. Okay, so we get five. Okay, so this, even if, they, if, if this was prohibited, right? So one could argue also that you could also pass just a simple function here, which was the same thing we had before, which would, be, which would make this mutually recursive by passing a function inside, right? So I'm just gonna call this, whatever, I'm gonna call this Fibonacci 2. So Fib2 was just gonna get a number and call Fibonacci, right, with n. And now my fn here can be this, and my fn here can be this, right? So I still get that. And, you know, even if they had made it mandatory for us to get the arguments here like n and fn, well, we could just define another function here and had this type of declaration here, declare what arguments a function takes inside of it. But one thing that's, I think, a bit more interesting is what if we didn't have even identifiers, right? What if they got mad and we couldn't even use identifiers to have recursion? Right, so I think, I think this is gonna be very fun, right? And now, I think I need your help, so I think I might give away chocolates for that. So let's start with our factorial function. I'm gonna write it in a shorter way, so, because this code is gonna be long, right? So let's start with factorial, right? Let's take n. And now, if n is equal to one, to zero, we're gonna just return one. Otherwise, factorial n minus one times n. Okay, there we go, console log of factorial. So now, uh, let's run this file. Now, I just wanna make sure you're following the idea here. The idea here is that we're gonna have a recursive function without using this name here and without using any identifiers, right? So it's just gonna be one function, right? No identifiers at all. And what do you think is the first thing that we can do in order to not have this reference here to factorial? Right, what's the easiest way of removing this? We've just, we've just done something quite similar before. Any ideas, anyone? Pass it as a function, right. So we're just gonna have f here, and we're gonna call this function like this. Right, so I'm gonna give you a chocolate before I continue with my explanation. Thank you. Um, so, now that we have this uh, factorial function here, Right, I'm gonna call this factorial generator, right, because it's not really factorial anymore. And now I can pass it literally any function. All right, so this function I'm gonna return, I don't know, version, and that's gonna be it. And now I can have a result, which is gonna be factorial generator here. And now I'm gonna pass it literally any function. It's literally any function, really. So, and then I'm gonna call it with five, and now we can console log the result of this. So I'm actually gonna start with zero, right? So let's see what happens when we do zero. Okay, we get one, right? Why do we get one? Well, because here, when we get to this part of the function, right, we have applied literally any function here, so we're now here, and this is literally any function. Okay, so we get to this part. We don't get to evaluate this. We just evaluate this, and we just return one. Well, what happens if I now, instead of using zero, use one. Oh, I get an M. Why do I get an M? Because I then evaluate this side. And if you remember, this side is literally any function. So I'm gonna multiply here a number by any function, which is gonna give me an M. And this is why I get an M here. So now I have a question for you. What's the easiest way for me to get the factorial of one, to make it work for the factorial of one? 
the very the easiest way. Does it need to be a good way? Anyone? Anyone want to guess? Sorry? Mm, you, not exactly, because then you cannot keep doing this as much as, as you go, right? But, but that was a valid enough answer, so you get a chocolate. Anyone else? Any guesses? Okay. So I'm just going to do the dumbest thing possible here, which is to wrap it inside another factorial generator call. Right? So now, when I get here, I'm going to have factorial generator with literally any function, right? And then I'm going to evaluate this, and I'm going to be able to get my result. So if I get now here this, I get one. Right? What if I try to get two? Oops, damn. Anyone want to guess what's the solution here? Anyone? You, do, you, you will get a chocolate. I know it's easy, but you will get a chocolate. Sorry, one at a time. Raise your hands. Great, chocolate. Chocolate for you. There you go. So let's wrap it one more time. Right? And now, do you get a photo of two? Yes, we do. Now, who is the vegan people, the vegan person? Well, if you want to get, uh, like, uh, I, I think I have vegan friendly chocolate here. I don't know. But do you want to guess what's the next thing I should do if I want to get the one more? Right. So you see, like, it's not very hard, right? I can just keep doing this. I mean, I can just do this ad infinitum. In fact, I can make this Vim do this for me, right? So I can just copy this, put this here, then do this, and this, paste this here. Let me repeat this. So I can just keep wrapping these things infinitely, right? So this, 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 copy this, put this here, go here. Then I can just repeat this infinitely, right? Is this what, what we want to do? Is this a good enough solution? Anyone? I don't think it is, right? So maybe we could just do it like 50 times, right? So wait for a bit. It's working. Trust me, we're going to get there. Ooh. <laughs> so we have Hadouken of uh, factorial generators. And now we can calculate very big factorials, right? Whoa, nice. Cool, that's what we need, right? Um, actually not. Sorry, guys. Um, that's not what we need. Um, so now uh, we need to talk about a concept I'll call the fixed point. So what is the fixed point of a function? Well, the fixed point of a function is when you apply a function to fixed point and you get back fixed point. So by definition, if you, you can replace these fixed points by another call to the same function passing its fixed point, right? And, well, you can do this ad infinitum. I think this looks like something we need, doesn't it? So why don't we all just get the fixed point of this factorial generator function so that we can always have the factorial generator inside of here? Right? Why don't we just do that? Let's just do that. Let's just implement a function which gets the fixed point of another function. So let's do this. Um, so I'm going to take a function. And I'm going to do the function fixed point of my function here. And now let's see what happens if I try to get the fixed point of my factorial generator function which is going to be this, oh, const, uh, now fixed point, this is factorial. I'm going to get the fixed point of my factorial generator function. Now let's see what happens. Does anyone think this is going to go well? Whoops, maximum call stack size exceeded. Now why did that happen? Well, that happened because JavaScript evaluates things eagerly, right? So when we call this fixed point function, we're going to be doing this a lot of times. Right, we're just going to keep evaluating fixed point inside of here infinitely, which is why we get a maximum call stack size exceeded. Let's remove this a bit. Right, let's go back to the here. So what's the easiest way? We've, we've done this already, right? What's the easiest way of delaying the execution of a function? Sorry, sorry? Add an argument, okay, so we're gonna wrap it inside other function, right? So this is a thunk, right? You've seen that on Redux thunk, correct? 
So if we now do factorial of five, what do we get? 120, nice. Uh, who gave me that answer, sorry? Nice, you got a chocolate? There you go. I'm getting good at this. Um, okay, but this is good, and this is what some people call Y, but we still need to have a name here, right? So even if we had that, we still have a reference to Y inside its body. It's not good enough, right? We can, we can do better, come on, we can do better. So let's go back to this function, let's, let's think for a bit. Now, what's the easiest way for me to have this function always have itself uh, when I call it with a number, when it recurs? Anyone? Anyone wanna try guessing? I have plenty of chocolate here, no, seriously, like, <laughs> we, we can do this all day long. Um, Oh, extra chocolate. Anyone? Okay, so here what I can do is just have f calling f, right? So now, this is actually not factorial generator, I'm gonna call this factorial recursive. So I have factorial recursive, and now for factorial, I can just refine it as factorial recursive, factorial recursive. So now I can call this, and I get 120. Okay, cool. Now the cool thing here is that if you look at this function, okay, it doesn't have any references to itself already, right? So you could just like do this, right? This is one thing we could do. Just get everything inside of here, put this here, and it was gonna be fine. But it's still not what we wanna do. Not, 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 it's not what we wanna do, right? We wanna, wanna do better, right? We can do better. Let's go back here and let's think of what can we do Right? Let's think about what can we do to remove this, right? Because we want to have a function which is gonna make any other function recursive without any, using any identifiers, right? So I want to remove this, okay? How can I remove this and still have it to work? Well, one thing that I can do is just have another function being passed here. I'm gonna do this. And now I'm gonna apply that function to itself. Right, because it's the same thing as doing f of f. Right, if I just apply the function itself and pass as f, it's the very same thing. Uh, is this gonna work? This, who thinks this is not gonna work? Please raise your hands if, if you think this is not gonna work. Okay, did, did you raise, raise your hand? Anyone, okay. So, he thinks this is not gonna work. Let's see what happens. Oh, didn't work. Nice, you got a chocolate. Oh, okay, uh, can you please give him the chocolate? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, okay, this didn't work, but what can we do to make, well, first, of all, first of all, why didn't it work? Well, it didn't work because we first get to g of g, which means we're just gonna be having g of g of g infinitely, right? This is not what we want. So, what can we do to make this, this uh, stack overflow not happen? Anyone? Nope, anyone? Please raise your hands if you wanna talk. Right, anyone? No guesses? We've done it. Right, that's a good guess, but that's not exactly it still. Anyone? Okay. Right, right, I, I see where, where you're coming from. Uh, it's still not that. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap it into another function, right? Uh, but that's fine, that's fine, you still get a chocolate. Uh, but do you, do you want chocolate? I think you were vegan, right? Or no? Would you like chocolate or? Okay, because I don't know who was vegan. I remember I threw, I threw a banana somewhere. Okay, if you're vegan, please let me know. It's um, okay, um, so now if we run this, we have them. Uh, let's see why, x of g, because I didn't pass x. Okay, we're back on track, all right, 120. Everything good, everything fine, we still can do better, right? We are gonna do better. I still don't like these calls here. I, I don't like them, you know, like names, 
Who needs that in 2019? No one needs that. Um, okay, who wants to get a chocolate? Um, do you know what's the easiest way of removing these names from here? How can we remove these names from here? All right, a very easy way. This, this one is like, clearly it's like free chocolate. I'm, I'm not even kidding. I, th I think they're going to be mad at me because I'm spending all the chocolate, but um, any guesses? Exactly. Very good. There you go, chocolate. Whoop! Uh, I don't think that was a good one. Sorry. Um, I think you deserve that chocolate because I threw that at you. I'm very sorry. So I'm going to throw another chocolate for him. Um, nice. Yay. Um, so we're going to copy and paste this here. And what do we get? Oops, because I'm calling factorial recursive with factorial recursive. And now this can just be factorial. Let's call this factorial. Oh, five, 120. Nice. We're getting there. We're getting there. Now, oh, sorry, I don't need this anymore. So, OK. Now, I don't like the fact that these are very long. And you know, copying and paste code is not a very, very nice thing, guys. Come on. Right? It's not, it's not very nice. Um, how can we move this function from here? Anyone? Come on, chocolate. Yes, pass it as an argument. Nice. Uh, actually, that's, that's kind of it. That's kind of it. I think you deserve it as a, a chocolate. But what I'm going to do here is just have this function as an argument for another function, which calls itself. Right? But that was pretty good, because that, that was hard to notice. This is your second chocolate already, right? You're a pro, right? Did I get it? Well, I hope I did. Um, anyway, let's go, let's go on, because I have five minutes. So we have here this, right? So now we don't need to copy and paste the function, right? Uh, OK, this looks very, pretty nice, isn't it? Like very readable, you know, easily understandable. Production ready, let's ship it, you know, git commit. Nice, git commit, fix everything. Um, okay, that's actually not it still. We're gonna get there. Now one thing that I don't like is that we have the factorial function inside of here. I don't think that this looks very nice, right? Because it only works for my factorial function and I want it to work for any function. So what do we do? Okay, the, the guy's gonna get so many shots. Would, would you like to just come here and get the whole basket? You can do, okay, what, 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 what's your guess? See, the, this guy's a pro. So, so many chocolate, like be, be careful with all the sugar, okay? Oop. I will eventually get better. I just need to show enough chocolates. Um, so I suppose there is an argument here. And let's remove this here. And now this is my factorial. And now I can put f here. And now this is make recursive. So now if I make my factorial function recursive, 120. Nice. So now we can make any functions recursive. Right, and this is what I call the y combinator. So we have nothing here that comes from the context, right? We pass everything in. But you know, names, you know, names. Need that, right? So let's just, uh, oops, so many parentheses lisp already. Um, and just do this, right? And now I can pass in my factorial function here, like this. Whoop. Five console log. Bang! Nice, nice, nice. Okay, so it works, and the, the cool thing is that it not only works for factorial, but it also works for like the Fibonacci function, right? So all I need to pass another function here is, let's say I wanted to write Fibonacci function, right? Have n, so if n is more than two, we're gonna do one, otherwise we're gonna do f. So instead of explicitly recurring, I'm gonna have this argument, I'm gonna be using this argument in order to do recursion. So I can just do n minus one, copy this, plus n minus two, right? So what do we get back? We get a number from Fibonacci sequence, and let's do this, and 
Bam, it works, right? You can even do zero here. Cool. So uh, I hope you've had fun. Uh, we have three minutes. Uh, so I'm sorry for the explode thing there. Uh, I really didn't want to spend too much time on this because I wanted to have the time for this. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you don't eat too much chocolate, especially you. Yes, I'm looking at you. Uh, be careful with all the sugar. Um, so thank you very much for being here today. I hope you have appreciated this. I hope it was fun. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Hello, Lucas. You are not supposed to steal my chocolate. This is sorry. not acceptable at all. Sorry, sorry. But would you like to join me for the yeah, two sure, minutes sure, we have? Sure. Don't take chocolate with you. I'm running out of chocolate here. Okay. Um, they have I have basket. questions. No, not necessarily about recursion, to be honest. And recursion right, right. is wonderful, yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, as well, we have many conversations in our industry about people who maybe need to have computer science degree to be front-end right. developers. Right. And people who kind of, you know, coming from the side and kind of hacking them, their way into front-end, so at some point they're actually becoming front-end developers. Um, do you, I mean, obviously, it's actually beneficial to have computer mm -hmm. science background to be mm -hmm. building today. Mm -hmm. uh, but is it critical and necessary? So I don't have a degree, actually. I dropped out of college uh, when I had one year to go. So I just gave it up. You know, like I've seen a guy with a sticker today saying, oh, yeah, like, you know, I don't have a degree because I went straight to the pros. Um, I think actually a computer science degree is, 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 it is indeed very important. I think like if you, like, it's good for you to understand concepts that you wouldn't actually learn when you like you're doing things, because they're not actually practical, but they shape the way you think. Yeah. So it's kind of like uh, you have this mental model of how to deal with problems. And also something I think you learn in, in, in academia is like how to do research and how to learn things by yourself. I think that's also uh, very important. And I also think it's important, even if you don't go to college, to actually like read papers and you know, look for talks online or look for, especially classes on more like formal subjects. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's, that's really, um, really useful, not not because you're gonna use it like in practice, but because you're gonna have like the mental models and you know you're gonna yeah. shape the way you think to to solve problems. So I think my like the fact that I have uh, I have gone to college for four years, I think that's been like very very beneficial. So I don't think the degree itself like the degree is just like a paper with your name. I think if you go there and you really try to learn things, you know, like if you really dedicate yourself, I think that's totally worth it. I think it's not for the paper with your name on it. I think it's for really what you learn there. I think that's, yeah. that's what matters. The reason also why I'm asking is because in many companies when they hire developers, front-end engineers, um, this will almost be a requirement that you actually have a formal mm -hmm. education in computer science mm -hmm. and all that. Um, and I think that at least when we look into machine learning, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and all that, the concepts that are actually quite difficult to grasp if you had no idea of how like, everything's happening behind the scenes, the modeling and all of that. Um, in many ways, I think like you, you know, it brought you to this world where you, you know, life code recursion for 40 minutes and all. Um, what else do you think is really critical to know, like especially from this world, from computer science, for front-end developers to really feel comfortable in the space? Right. I think, I think discrete math is, is a quite interesting topic to read about. Um, I also think, um, so one thing that also, as you've talked about interviews, I think, uh, when it comes to uh, like no, being able to know the asymptotic complexity of algorithms and you know how to compare one algorithm to the other, um, like just you know also when you deal with like databases and that kind of stuff, like I think that's that's something that's very important for you. I think even if you don't go to college to learn that, I think it's it's something very useful to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think especially yeah discrete math as I've said. Um, what else? I think. If you're going to, like, if you're doing a course which has some project management, you know, if we, which talks about, you know, how to manage people and that kind of stuff, because, um, you know, there's computer science, there are other courses that are more geared towards, like, the market, which teach you that kind of thing. I think that's also very useful, because, mm -hmm. you know, like, people skills are as important as, you know, engineering, like, what they call hard skills. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's, those are things that are very important. Uh, talking about art skills, do you think it's also critical to know ASCII art? Critical to know ASCII art. Well, and by the way, I'd say it's useful. I'd say I'd say it's useful. I'd say it's useful. I mean, 
you can you can do you can, you can do very nice things with OSCIART. I think like uh, so one day these things will be museums and we will be all looking at them and you know admiring them like we admire painters, painters in the past. So you know just do OSCIART, sell them for millions, you know. Well, that could be. It, you can, you know, this is the next big thing. Yeah, okay, make a point, career, we just, you know, we just need a, a nice branding name for it. Exactly. So all you need to do, you know, you, you make some mask art, you sell it for a very expensive price. Once you've sold the first one, this is it. you can sell all the other ones. Yeah. We like the bank, Banksy ASCII kind of thing. Banksy, yeah, I yeah. quite like Banksy. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, great. That's that's the future, I think. Yeah. Uh, with this in mind, we're kind of running out of time. But there are a couple of questions. Uh, maybe just one, and then we okay, finish okay. off. And Nikola is asking on trampoline slide, and I have no idea what. Right, right, right. But you probably will. On trampoline slide, you need a wild construction to get the result. It seems like a bad smelling code. Why not just wrapping the evaluation of factorial of five into a parameterless lambda and then evaluating this lambda when needed? So I, I see where you're coming from. So you mean like, because well, you, you mean like when we did. Uh, it's probably that person who got all the chocolate. Sorry? Probably that person who got all the chocolate. Um, I'm not sure I got that, but like, yeah, okay. uh, yeah I, I agree with you that this is, this is, a, is, a, is a bad way of, of dealing with it. Uh, but actually, like, when you have, for example, proper deal calls, you know, you don't really get to have the recursive calls. You actually, like, you eliminate them. I know, like, for example, when, when uh, I think when Haskell gets compiled, if I'm not mistaken, gets um, transformed into kind of like labels, so you have like jumps. Uh, instead of really having, you know, recursion. Um, so I think, yes, indeed, it's a bad way, but I think it's doable, and I think it's simple enough. And also, the way I've done it, I've simply throw a while in the middle of nowhere. Right? That's, that's really, really bad. But you can actually wrap that into a function which trampolines other functions, right? So you can have a function which takes a function inside of it, you put your while there, so you're kind of like, you know, you're separating the mess from everything else. Mm -hmm. Right, like, when you have, like, Io and Haskell, you know, you separate that, from all the other mass, all the other indeterministic mass, you know. Uh, so, yeah, you can, you can definitely do that and That's make perfect. it better. That answers the question. Uh, maybe the very, very last one, very quickly. If somebody wants to dive in into this kind of topics, be it recursion, computer science, all of that, are there any resources you can recommend? Yes, like definitely, it? definitely. I actually have some references here. May I just, I'm gonna leave this open really quickly because I'm gonna very quickly go through them because I think there's some excellent material here in the last slide. So there's um, a few papers here uh, which are quite useful. Uh, I think uh, the first ones by a guy called, I think it's Edgar G. Daylight, they're quite good. Uh, Robert Sorry has some papers on it. There's plenty of stuff uh, online. So you will read mostly of this when people talk about things in the ES6 spec that was, weren't uh, implemented, like um, property of calls. You find some polls about that. Uh, also, like, some quite, quite good papers. Uh, I didn't put in there like some more mathematical stuff because I didn't really use any of that for that talk. But if you're really uh, into that, there's like plenty of stuff you can find online. If you just like search for papers that have recursion on their name, you're gonna find so many things like from, you know, very broad range of topics from like linguistics, from, you know, computability theory. You know, there's so many many topics this, this touches. It was actually hard to <coughs> select very few things to speak in an hour. You know. Right, that's, that's fine. Perfect, thank you so much Thank for you. being with us today. Thank you, well done. Thank you. Well done, sir.